Yes. How's everyone doing tonight? Man, that was like the deepest cheer I've heard. Normally it's like, ah, but that's because the middle scores are loud. Um, oh, the TVs are on. Okay, we're good. Uh, tonight we are starting a new series um, on spiritual warfare and looking uh, at the armor of God. Uh, so last week, if you guys remember, in small groups, if you were here, the very last question, if you made it to it, was what do you know about spiritual warfare? And it was funny because I got uh, some funny like responses, especially from the middle schoolers, like this one kid. I was like, what do you know about spiritual warfare? And he goes, well, uh, sometimes there's these kids who are Muslim and they get bullied and, and I was like, oh, wait, hold on. <laughs> what are we talking about here? So um, one of the high schoolers, I think it might have been Cash, that said uh, spiritual warfare is constant, which is true. So we're going to be looking at spiritual uh, warfare and the armor of God at each piece of God's armor, like it talks about in Ephesians 6. You guys not have fill in the blanks? Oh, all right. Where's the fill in the blanks? No, from like Corey on, there's nothing. There's no, there's not another Joe. Sorry. All right. Well, fill in the blanks are coming around. Uh, but we are going to be looking at spiritual warfare. The series is called Make War and going through the pieces uh, of armor. Um, but tonight, before we look at the actual uh, pieces of armor, like the belt of truth, the shoes of peace, do you guys know them all? Apparently not. That's okay. Huh? Did someone say one? The the armor of God. Do you know him, Cash? Shield of faith and short or sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So we're gonna be looking at those. But before we get into that tonight, uh, we're first gonna look at who uh, our battle is against. And so in Ephesians uh, 6 verses 10 through 12 is where we're going to start throughout this whole series. We are going to be in Ephesians 6 for basically the entire time. But starting tonight, Ephesians 6 verses 10 through 12 says, a final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. It says, put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. We have to understand as Christians uh, that we are in a spiritual warfare, and it is not against other people. It is not against flesh and blood en enemies. It is not against the people you don't get along with or the teachers that you don't like in school or your parents when they make you mad. But you are in a constant spiritual battle against things of the unseen world. And some of this might be like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. If, especially if this is your first time here. If you don't know Jesus, don't worry. It's not weird. Because uh, the, the fact is, while we are going to be talking about uh, the enemy and who our, our, uh, who the devil is uh, tonight, I don't want to give like much air time to the devil and so just know that the enemy has already been defeated, that he has no power, he has no authority, um, but you still have to recognize uh, his strategies, recognize how he might uh, attack, recognize temptations that you face in life so that you can stand firm, so you can resist these things, and so that you can stay no, uh, knowing that you're in a constant battle. However, you are on the victorious side if you know Jesus. And just like Pastor Rick said on Sunday, once you know what something is, then you know how to handle it or how to face it. And so before we get too much farther, let's pray. So Jesus, we just thank you for tonight, Lord. I thank you for your word that it is alive and powerful, that it is sharper than any two-edged sword. Lord, so I pray that as you, your word is just spoken tonight, as we hear your word, that uh, our ears would be open, our heart would be ready to receive, and it would land on good soil. Lord, I pray that our focus and our attention would be on you tonight. I pray that we would just come expecting to receive something from you, Lord. So just use uh, my words tonight. Lord, and I thank you that you are in this place. And in your name we pray. Amen. So there is a very famous book called The Art of War. I don't know if you guys have heard of it. It's written by this like Chinese general. His name is like Sun Tzu. But it's a very famous book about like uh, military strategies. And there's a quote from the book that says this. 
Thus we may say that if you know yourself and know your enemy, you will gain a victory a hundred times out of a hundred. If you know yourself but do not know your enemy, you will meet one defeat for every victory. And if you know neither yourself or your enemy, you will never be victorious. And so we can take this quote and do a, a spiritual mindset saying if we know who we are in Christ and we know the enemy and how he's going to attack us, the, the temptations he's going to throw at us, then we will be victorious 100% of the time. But if we, know, uh, if we know who we are in Christ but we don't know the enemy, it says you'll be one defeat for every victory. And if you don't know who you are and you don't know the enemy, then you will never be victorious. You have to know your enemy how they attack, and their weaknesses, and that can be the difference in winning or in losing. And so uh, my junior year of high school, how many, do you guys know what TP Wars is? How many of you guys have done TP Wars? So, dang, not a lot of you, but you guys all know what it is, right? It's juniors, well, at Wellington, I mean, at least at Pooters, juniors versus seniors, during homecoming week. So throughout the entire homecoming week, all the juniors are on one team, all the seniors are on another team, and all they do is uh, just like you TP the other person's house. So you take toilet paper, you throw it on their trees, over their houses, everything. But um, I took TP Wars pretty seriously. I was real into it. My mom said parents didn't care what time I came home, so there would be nights so I was home at like 4 a.m., and they'd be like, that's fine as long as you get to school the next morning because we were just out throwing toilet paper uh, around. And things were different. There wasn't as many cameras. I'm not like that old. I graduated like f five years ago. And still, there was like very few houses with cameras. Nowadays, you guys get caught doing anything. But my junior year of TP Wars, um, I was hanging out with a bunch of the seniors the week before TP Wars. And so some of like we were going to the store. We were stocking up. On toilet paper, I was hanging out with the seniors, which was nice because then I was like knowing where the houses were, but they thought I was just hanging out. And so one of them decided to add me to the seniors group chat for TP Wars because they thought I was on their side. And so they add me to the seniors group chat. I'm like, this is the greatest thing ever and the dumbest thing that this person could have done, but I'm not going to say anything. And so TP Wars comes around, it starts on Monday. And the seniors are blowing up this group chat. They're like, this is where we're going tonight. And they list off all the houses uh, uh, of the juniors that they're going to go to. And it's like, we're going to meet at the school at this time, and then we're going. And I was like, all right. So then I went to the juniors group chat, and I was like, hey, all the seniors are meeting at the school at this time, and then they're hitting all of these houses. So then the seniors got to the school, and we were there waiting for them. And they're like, are you kidding me? They drove off. Then they got to the first house, and the, the house that it was was just sitting in the front yard waiting for them. So then they went to the next house, and we were waiting for them. And they went to the next house, and there was people waiting for them. And then they'd be like, this isn't working. Let's go to this place. And then I'd see it. I'd be like, hey, juniors, now they're going over here. And for the first three days of TP Wars, anything the seniors did, I knew what they were doing because I was sitting in the group chat, and they had no idea. And so I'm feeding all the information to the juniors. They're getting really mad. They start posting things on their story like, whoever's doing or like, however you guys know where we're going or we're going to get you guys, like all this stuff. And I was like, oh, gosh, this is like it, once they catch me, like this is going to be rough. And then sure enough, on the third day, someone's like, there's a mole in the group chat. And I'm like, oh, shoot. The only junior in the group chat, of course, I'm going to get called out. And someone's like, why is Nevin in here? He's a junior. And then all my friends are like, no, Nevin's fine. He's not doing it. And I'm like, man, I'm still just not saying anything. I'm like, I, I don't want to get in the middle of this. I'm already in too far. And um, finally, they start kicking everyone out of the group chat. So then I see, like, all these people getting kicked out, and I'm still in it. And I'm like, what is going on? Like, these people are all just, like, turning and fighting each other, and they have no idea. And then finally, finally, I got booted out of the group chat. But at that point, it was already too late. And the seniors were so frustrated and done that the and the juniors hit every house because we knew where they were going to be. So it's like, oh, great. These guys are TPing. Go to their house at this time, and they won't be there. And all week, it was like the most annoying thing for the seniors because I knew what their strategy was. I knew how they were going to attack. And then the juniors could very easily be prepared to defend ourselves. And it was like the easiest like victory ever because we knew everything the seniors were going to do. 
So we were prepared in order to defend. And in the same way, in your spiritual walk with God, if you know how the enemy is going to attack you, if you know how the, the temptations he's going to throw at you, if you know the strategies of the devil, it is a lot easier to recognize them and say no. If you know his strategy and you know the, the enemy that you are going against, it is so much easier to be victorious. I knew everything the seniors were doing and all the juniors did, so it was easy for us to be in the right spot. It was easy for us to defend ourselves. It was easy for us to know the right time to push back and, and take ground. And we have a book that talks about how to be successful, how to be victorious in your walk with Christ. You can look at the strategies of Satan, like Haley talked about in The Truth, and Satan, like when he tempts Jesus, he goes after Jesus when he's tired. He goes after Jesus when, when he's hungry. He tries to find time when Jesus is vulnerable, but Jesus always responds to temptation with the word of God, which is the same way that we have to respond to temptation. So we have to know the enemy, know his strategies. And if we know how we're going to be attacked, then we can defend ourselves. We can take up our armor and stand firm against the attacks of the enemy. And so point number one, as we look at some of the strategies of Satan tonight, is point number one is Satan is the accuser. Satan is the accuser. His, the Hebrew word for Satan is uh, diabolos, which is translated to accuser. Like this is literally what his word means, but Satan uh, is the accuser of the world. It says in Revelations 12, verse 10, it has come at last, salvation and power in the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters has been thrown down to earth, the one who accuses them before God day and night. So Satan is going to accuse you of your sins. Satan does not want you to receive God's grace. He does not want you to receive God's forgiveness. So he will lie to you. He will bring up your past life. He will bring up your past sin and constantly try to remind you of who you used to be. Constantly try to remind you that, that you are not worthy to go to God. He will bring up your past and your old sins and your old mistakes to try to remind you of who you used to be to get you to turn away from God. It says in John 8, 44, this is talking about Satan. It says he was a murderer from the beginning. He always hated the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, it is consistent with his character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. All Satan will do is lie to you, accuse you of your sins, bring up your past, try to, 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 make God, or to make you feel like you're not worthy. But he is the father of lies. There is no truth in him. And so we have to fight back and pierce the father of lies with God's truth. With the word of God, which is the sword of spirit, we have armor that we can put on in the, the sword of the spirit. And Satan has nothing but lies and accusations. He will attempt to slander you, to discredit uh, believers and make accusations about you before God. This is what he does to Job. Do you guys know who Job is in the Bible? The book of Job, it is not Job if you've seen it. Um, it is the book of Job. But Job, uh, Satan goes to God and says that Job only loves, he, he tells God, Job only loves you because he has everything in life, because of all the blessings that you have given him. And so God, this is like a very interesting story, but God says, all right, like I will prove to you that Job loves me, not just because of the blessings. So then Satan starts to attack Job like no other. Job loses everything, his family, uh, he, he, like all die, he loses like he loses everything. He gets sick. All these terrible things happen, and yet the accusation that Satan brought before God was proved wrong because everything was taken from Job, and yet Job still loved God. He still did not turn away from God. But Satan will try to accuse you of things or bring up your past, remind you of your failures to convince you that you are not worthy of the kingdom of God, to be in the family of God. He wants you to feel uh, ashamed. He wants you to feel unworthy. He wants you to feel alone. 
so that you try to go through your struggles by yourself, so that you isolate yourself from people who can help you, or you isolate yourself from youth group or church. But you have to remember that he is the father of lies, and he is just lying to you to steal from you the amazing things that God has planned for you. And thankfully, we have an advocate to prove Satan's accusations and prove his lies wrong. In 1 John 2, verses 1 through 2, it says, My dear children, I am writing this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the only one who is truly righteous. So Jesus is your advocate. He is speaking on your behalf. So when Satan tries to bring up your past or bring up your failures, bring up your sins, Jesus is your advocate that speaks on your behalf and says those things are gone. They were washed away by the price that Jesus paid on the cross, washed away by the blood that was shed on the cross. And it says in Isaiah that, that he took your skins of scarlet and makes you as white as snow. So Jesus is your advocate who speaks on your behalf. He is the one who is truly righteous, and he fought for you on the cross. He defeated the enemy and walked out of the grave victorious, and now he invites you to join him in victory. Jesus wants to, to build you up in life. Jesus comes to give you a life uh, more abundant, but G, uh, Satan's only uh, goal is to tear, to steal, to kill, and to destroy the plan that God has for you. So point number two is Satan comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He's the father of lies. He's the accuser of our bre brethren, and he wants nothing but bad things for you. It says in John 10, 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it more abundantly. The enemy's only purpose is to steal what God has for you, is to kill your relationship with God, and is to destroy the plan that God has laid out for your life. Your relationship with Jesus is the biggest uh, threat to Satan. So he wants you to walk away uh, from your, your walk with God. He does not want you to live with Jesus. And as Christians, we have to recognize this. We have to recognize that Satan comes to steal, to kill, to destroy. And we have to stay alert. It says in 1 Peter 5, 8, stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. We looked at this uh, la the last two weeks, actually, and to see that we need to recognize times where we are vulnerable as Christians. Recognize times where we fall into temptation most often. Recognize times where, where we know that Satan will attack us, whether it's with the wrong group of friends, whether it's when you're tired, uh, when, when you're just home alone, whatever it is, you have to recognize these times and then do something about it so that you can stand firm in your walk with God. He is uh, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. So he will wait until you are most vulnerable. He will wait until you are tired. He will wait until you put yourself in a position that you shouldn't be in. And then that is when he will attack. That is when he will try to tempt you. That is when Oftentimes we stumble, but we cannot let our guard down, but instead put on God's armor and stand firm. In Ephesians 6, 11, it says, put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. So you stand prepared uh, and firm against these temptations by putting on the armor of God. And so throughout this series, we are going to look at the different parts of honor, uh, of armor, the purpose of each of them, uh, what each of, each of them, uh, how it relates uh, to, to our daily life, because you're not actually putting on physical armor, but we're going to look through the armor of God and how to stand firm against attacks, but then also how to go on offense and take ground, because it is not just like a hostile or not just like a passive thing where you just sit back all the time. You have a shield of faith and a sword of the Spirit, 
which can both be used in an offensive way. So don't just always be a passive Christian, but we are going to look through that. Um, but you have to recognize strategies of the devil and then be prepared so you can stand in victory, so you can stand firm uh, as you walk and as you follow Jesus, just as we talked about uh, in small groups uh, last week, recognizing these areas so that you can stand firm and you can be prepared. Just like the juniors were prepared for everything that the seniors threw at them in TP Wars, just like for any of you who play football and how you have to watch like 10 hours of film that week on the team that we're going to play and so you can learn the strategies uh, of the other team. Man, peoples in Dietrich are crazy, but they watch so much film on the other team that they'll stand on the sideline and be like, and just call out the play because they've seen so much film. Because they know what the enemy uh, it strategy is. And you have to know Satan's strategy. Uh, Satan loves to twist the word of God. He's the father of lies. So he loves to twist the word of God just like he does to Jesus in the wilderness. Where he says, doesn't the word say? But he took it out of contest. He twisted God's word. And then Jesus responded, standing on the word of God. He wants us, uh, Satan wants you to think that he is equal to God. He wants, you to, like, he wants you to think it's this yin and yang thing, that Satan and God are on like the same level. Like I always tell you guys this, but I hate the, like, the, the graphic I see on social media sometimes of like Satan and, uh, and Jesus arm wrestling, and both of them for some reason are like jacked, and they're both just at this like standstill, not moving. It's not even close. Like We know who won the battle. He wants you to think he's equal to God, but he is nowhere close. And he wants you to think that he is omnipresent, but he isn't. Like, he is not God. And so many people have this, like, idea that, that Satan is, like, the ruler of hell or the king of hell. But that's not true at all. Like, that is his holding place. That is where he it was placed by God. And then in the end, he's going to be thrown in the pit of fire. Like, he is not the king of hell. Like, I've had people literally tell me, like, oh, well, me and Satan, like, we're going to be friends in hell. I'm like, you have no idea what you are talking about. Satan has no power. And point number three tonight is that Satan has no power. The reality is he has been defeated, and he has no power over you. In Luke 10, 19, it says, look, I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy, so you can walk among snakes and scorpions, and nothing will injure you. You have authority over the enemy. Through the victory that Jesus won for you on the cross, he humiliated the enemy and gives us authority over him. It says in Colossians 2.15, which is like my favorite verse in the Bible, but in this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities, and he shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. This is known as Christ's triumphal procession, where he defeats the enemy, he shames the enemy, and then he leads a parade and victory out of the grave, and he leads this parade and victory, and he invites all of us to join him in victory. Jesus makes a public spectacle of the enemy. He humiliates Satan. And then invites us to join him in victory. It says in Romans 16, 20, that the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. May the grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. And there are verse after verse after verse that show that the enemy is defeated and that Jesus is victorious. It says in 1 John 3, 8, but when people keep on sinning, it shows that they belong to the devil who has been sinning since the beginning, but the Son of God came to destroy the works of the devil. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil, and destroy in Greek is luo, and it means to pronounce or determine that something is no longer bound. So he came to destroy the works of the devil. He came to pronounce that you are no longer bound by Satan. That you are no longer bound by temptation or by sin or by the enemy. But you have authority over the devil. You have authority over Satan. And he is defeated and has no power. You do not have to be bound by the enemy any longer or by sin any longer. But you can walk in victory and in freedom with Jesus. 
and then putting on the armor of God as we go throughout this series so that you can stand firm against the fiery darts of the enemy. You can stand firm against the temptations. You can stand firm against the, the strategies and the things that Satan will throw at you. But you have to know who the enemy is. Recognize the areas where you are most vulnerable and then know his strategies so that you can stand firm uh, and grow in your relationship with God. And so tonight we're going to go into worship really quick. And as we go into worship, just know that the God we are worshiping is victorious. He defeated the enemy. And he gives you authority over the devil. So Jesus, we just thank you for tonight, Lord. I pray that as we go into worship, I thank you that your word says where two or more are gathered in your name, that there you are among them. That your word says that you are enthroned upon the praises of your people. So Lord, we just give you praise and glory and honor tonight. We, we just surrender uh, to you uh, and give you our worship. Lord, and I thank you that you are in this place. And your word says where the spirit of the Lord is there is freedom. And in your name we pray. Amen.